Sideshow presents Get Super with Joshy G. Featuring today's special guest, Ethan Page. It's time to get super. super. Hey everyone, what's going on? What's up, Sideshow community? It's the one and only Joshy G, and I am here with the man himself, Ethan Page. Ethan, how are you doing, my friend? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm amazing, mostly because I get to do this interview with you guys, and I'm a big Sideshow Collectibles customer and fan, oh. so this is uh, very cool for me, so yeah. As we would say in the wrestling world, you're a big Sideshow mark, is that correct? Yes, 100%. <laughs> for those of you that may not know anything about pro wrestling or most importantly Ethan Page. Uh Ethan, what uh when you were start when you were at a young age, what were some of the things that you loved growing up as far as toys and collectibles? Ooh. Toys and collectibles growing up uh, really big for me were um especially with wrestling, the LJN figures at the start, the big rubber ones. Uh-huh. Uh, I had a Hulk Hogan, I had a Macho Man, and I had a Ultimate Warrior. And those were like the starting point of my real toy collecting. And then it got into, you know, Batman the Animated Series. I had a few of those, and that's kind of sparked like, uh, in, I'm 31 years old now, and I have nearly the entire set on card um, from the original 90s cartoon, just because, you know, that's like, your childhood it's the memories of the greatest times of your life and those were like really the big toys for me and like power rangers and uh you see behind me like the x-men and spider-man any kind of cartoon or animated thing that i was into uh the toys came with it so yeah. it's so interesting growing up in, in the in the you know late 80s early 90s as you are were discussing and the fact that you know there's so many toys out there at least for young men and i'm sure for young ladies as well they mean so much to us. So when you grow up, right, and you get a little bit of adult money, as we like to call it, if we didn't, if we didn't, <laughs> if we didn't save those particular items, we would go back and purchase them. And would you say that the Batman animated series mint on card is your holy grail, or is there something from your childhood that you wish that you would have held on to, or that you are still currently looking for? So. I will have like a Holy Grail until I get it, which the like utility belt Batman, it was the first Batman they made. It's just the basic gray suit, black cowl, yellow belt. Um, to find that on cards, very hard and it's extremely valuable for collectors. So to get, I've, I eventually got that. It was actually gifted to me by uh, Hornswoggle from professional wrestling, okay. a good friend of mine. So he, he ruined the hunt and the chase for me, but also I was so appreciative of it because where I was in my life, purchasing a toy at that cost was definitely not in the cards for Ethan Page of the past. And uh, once I got that, it started turning into, okay, well, now I have that collection done. What am I hunting down next? And it was the original Power Rangers in like the triangle boxes. And then it was the Power Ranger bad guys. So the, the Holy Grail eventually just keeps getting higher and higher and crazier and crazier. That is cool, though, that you had a friend that was willing to help you in your hunt for your Holy Grail. And if any of my friends are listening, uh, I will give you a long list. I will feel no shame if you want to purchase my Holy Grail for me. That will save me a lot of time, effort, and stress going to different stores looking for that. But no, that that's really cool. And, and now searching for those Bandai Power Rangers uh, and other things. Now, you, you, you talked a little bit about professional wrestling earlier earlier in the in the interview are were you immediately drawn into wrestling or were you was it just another thing that added to your you know saturday morning viewings um it was my dad actually my dad was really into wrestling when i was very young so he would kind of like joke around with me and like he would always have a toothpick in his mouth and call me chico because he loved razor ramon Mm -hmm. uh so he would do like you know the Hogan or he would do macho man's voice with the hand. And like, I don't know. It was a, it was a thing we watched together. He took me to my first live events. Uh, we had posters of wrestlers up on my wall. So it's like now with my daughter, I'm influencing her in the kind of this similar way without even thinking about it because I'm so into like this room is covered in superhero like collectibles and stuff like that. So she loves that kind of stuff now too. So it's essentially just, what I grew up around was professional wrestling because my dad loved it so much and 
it, it stuck with me. Now, getting into professional wrestling is a whole different story. Do you think that uh, that was a dream that you wanted to achieve yourself? Or was that something where you were like, oh, man, my dad loved it so much that I kind of want to impress him? Looking at your dad's love for professional wrestling, was that kind of the, the jump start for you to get into professional wrestling? No, because he did not want me to start wrestling oh, at really? all. I remember when I, yeah, I remember when I came up to him and kind of like expressed interest in joining this local school. Uh, he was like, yeah, this is a terrible idea. You're going to break your neck. Do not do this. Like this place looks insanely like not professional. It was, it was in like a warehouse. You could see the rust on everything in the building. It was gross, but, uh, I really wanted to do it. And he said, okay, look, we've supported pretty much every interest that you've had, but this is not one that we believe in because it's dangerous. And this doesn't look like a very professional spot. So if you want to go, you're going to have to do it yourself, get there yourself, pay for it yourself. Um, now fast forward 15 years later and he's wearing my t-shirt yeah. telling his friends to tune in every Wednesday night on TSN in Canada and TNT in the States. Um, they were very supportive once they saw how serious I was about it. But, uh, no, it was just, um, a passion of mine that I kind of through the attitude era ish, uh, I fell back in love with professional wrestling and found like a group of kids in my elementary school who did backyard wrestling. So it was just uh, the people I was around, my surroundings that kind of got me into professional wrestling, found that local school. And then from there, my the way my brain works, just like I have to constantly set higher expectations of myself and goals. And it was just escalating slowly. And I obsess over things. So uh, it became my obsession. And it's been that for almost 15 years it's so interesting to hear you say that we've had obviously a bunch of other wrestlers on the show and they for the most part have pretty much the same kind of story the same kind of passion the same kind of drive hey look if you're going to do this you know their parents or their folks saying hey if you want to do this you got to put yourself through it and the fact of the matter is if you did not have that drive if you didn't have that determination we wouldn't be sitting here talking to you uh, about your success in professional wrestling, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, obviously, you don't just jump right into the big leagues. You don't jump right into these big money contracts where you can purchase your very own uh, utility belt Batman. You got to kind of struggle a little <laughs> bit. If you follow wrestling, right, you understand like, yeah, there are these independents and these these lower promotions. But if you're a, a, you know, a sideshow, a, a casual sideshow fan, you may not know that there are smaller uh, leagues within professional wrestling. They, they usually see the big ones like WWE or AEW or even, you know, Impact Wrestling. How was that, you know, cutting your teeth on those smaller independent So I, my local newspaper interviewed me after uh, I debuted on Dynamite. And the one question he asked me it kind of encompassed everything. He said, what's the lowest you've made on like one of these independent shows? And I said, I don't know, like probably negative $500. And he like died. It's because people don't understand the cost of just going to these events because there's only so many events happening locally. So when I started training at this school, I essentially stopped a couple weeks in because I realized that, well, well, I probably had a big ego back then. So <laughs> let's fast forward to my character now, all ego eats a page. But um, back then I, I realized that the people that were teaching me how to wrestle weren't even working in the companies that I wanted to go to. Uh, nobody was like brushing shoulders with the people that I actually watched wrestling. So there was one or two local guys that were driving to Chicago to do IWA mid South or driving to Cleveland or driving to New York city. So I would hop in the car with them, pay them gas money because the promoters aren't paying their gas. So we're splitting tanks just to get there, then getting paid maybe $20 if I even get on the event. So half the time I was just offering to sweep or hold a camera or play music. And then eventually you start building these relationships. And then by then I'm learning from guys like Chris Hero or Roderick Strong or eventually working with guys like Johnny Gargano. So essentially that was my wrestling training that I was paying into was being able to be on these events with some of the best wrestlers in the world today in 2021 back then. But there's not a lot of stuff locally, so you're going to have to travel out. It's it's pretty crazy. Well, it's also, too, just such an incredible life lesson that I think people, no matter what industry you're in, right, we can just say, let's just 
let's take wrestling out of the equation and let's say you want to be a comic book artist or a comic book sculptor or something, right? You have to pay your dues in some way, shape or form. You're very yeah. rarely, if at all, you're going to get something handed to you. And so when you're yeah. cutting your teeth in these independent scenes, you make the big break in 2014 and Ring of Honor. What was that like going into Ring of Honor yeah. and, you know, getting your first taste of a big wrestling promotion? I was, I was literally, you just took the words out of my mouth. It was really my first taste of, um, kind of being given a bigger opportunity with a bigger platform and to get like the pressure put on a little bit. And it was a big lesson in, in like chasing a contract essentially too, and trying to please promoters. And I think at the time I was just so wrapped up in potentially getting a job that I was willing to kind of give myself up to these places. And that's, these are lessons I had to learn for many years. Uh, I let them change my name. Um, because they already had a page there. So this was like a really big part of me growing as a performer and kind of realizing who I am and the value of what I bring to the table and kind of staying true to me. But in that same sense, I, I got to brush shoulders with some of the best wrestlers in the world. I got to have matches in ring of honor with some of the best in the world. And I was teaming with um, Josh Alexander at the time as the monster mafia. So that's also history that was built into our future team as the North and impact wrestling. Mm -hmm. So it was a big part of, although a very short period, it was a big part of my career and my growth. And I can say I had a cup of coffee there, which is pretty cool too, just to throw on my resume that I've worked for essentially most, if not all big promotions before getting to AEW. Now, when you're, when you're going through these small independent promotions and like you said, ring of honor, they, they, they changed your name a little bit. Was there a gimmick or was there a name that they kind of threw past you where you're just like, oh, man, this is not me. I don't want to be a garbage man. I don't want to be, a you know, was there ever a gimmick or a personality that they wanted you to be in or you were just like, look, this isn't for me. Sorry. For Ring of Honor, no. Um, it was just because my last name was Paige and they um, essentially were like dangling the carrot of potentially having a contract. So they just wanted to have a different name. The way I presented myself and the character and stuff like that was essentially the same. Um, but to me, I was traveling all over the independence, kind of building this reputation. And then I had to change my name. So it's like a Nike changing their name halfway through. So it's like, to me, it was like, oh, there goes all my branding and yeah. all the work I put into it. But eventually, once I finished up there, I just continued as ethan page and uh here we are today i still have the name all ego ethan page so it ended up working out okay yeah totally and then now since you know you you're at ring of honor you know you're starting to get some uh, notoriety are you able to still maintain uh your collecting <laughs> bug or so at the time i would say the only thing i really collected was uh wrestling figures and i don't i think maybe i was 20 21 still playing with action figures. That's how I came up with every tag team move the North has ever done uh, was literally me playing with wrestling figures at, at over the age of 20 years old. I have no shame in admitting that. But uh, after I would say a year in impact is when I really started getting deep into um, collecting and making this room as crazy as, as it is. Uh, at that time I was married and things are a little bit you know we have the same home so before this i was trying to impress my wife and you know <laughs> buy a condo so i looked like an adult collecting was really not <laughs> the biggest priority i might have had like a dwayne johnson shrine with a couple of his figures and then just wrestling figures but this whole thing was essentially my wife got me one uh statue of venom and i just fell in love with it i was like oh this is okay with you you, you're okay if yeah. I, you know, start collecting stuff like this. She didn't know how crazy it would get, but it's her fault. So if anything ever gets thrown in my face, I always bring up the Venom statue <laughs> because she started it all. Yeah, I, I look, I think that you're not the only male out there that has a, a story like that where they had to compromise with a <laughs> significant other regarding their trophy room or their man cave or their, their collectible room. Uh, I do think that it's kind of cool that your wife bought you a Venom statue. Yeah. I also feel that there is no shame in you admitting that you played with wrestling figures up into your 20s. Um, I mean, so that, that's essentially what my wife said to me. When she 
walked into my condo and caught me cross-legged in my bedroom with a wrestling ring and figures in my hand <laughs> at the age of 23. And <laughs> I was like, oh, this is so embarrassing. I'm like practicing moves for a show this weekend. She's like, oh, I would rather catch you doing this than being at a club or something. So I was like, oh, okay, that's good. Well, that's good. I'm not a big party. Or yeah, something. exactly. And also, you were not lying. You you technically were practicing moves. You just had a federation that you had to get through the card, I guess, I were, or I'm assuming. Exactly. I had to find out who won the world title, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, now, we, we didn't really get into this, too, but growing up um, as a young child or a young boy, then you're now in your 20s. What did you do was, was for as far as fitness goes? Uh, were you motivated by anybody? So uh, my dad has always been like really into working out. Um, he put a home gym in for me, and I've always worked out on a regular basis. Um, obviously, routine and diet changed, and I would say diet was never really a thing that I stuck to until maybe just under a year ago. Um, up until that point, I essentially just did bodybuilding lifts. Um, I've tried CrossFit before. Um, I've tried essentially anything to do with working out, but it was all just for wrestling. Like I've told my wife, the minute my career is over, I'll be the fattest man <laughs> you have ever met in your entire life. I just have a relationship with food that trumps literally everything and anything. So the minute that I do not have to be in shape uh, for this career, I will not. Um, but I always lifted. So even though I ate like crap essentially my entire career until last year, uh, I would always, always, always work out. So when it came time to shedding all the fat, I had a lot of muscle underneath. I'm not suggesting anyone does this, the 15-year bulk, but I mean, it worked out for me, so... <laughs> Yeah, I, we. I was having this conversation with, uh, you know, my girlfriend the other day. It's just like, man, I love food so much, and it is very hard when you nowadays. There's not just one type of Oreos. There's 15 types of Oreos. There's, you know, I'm yeah. I'm a big fan of artisanal ice cream, and the the way these these people get you is like, oh, guess what? New flavors this month, and you're just like, son of a. I just want to be able to to eat healthy for a month, and you guys are releasing new flavors, and this I can't miss out on this. So yeah, I get that it's type is very very hard did you also find with obviously the temptations of delicious and good food did you find it very being on the road extremely difficult to maintain a proper oh, diet and exercise routine I like especially I, I would say that's where I would always end up breaking my diets and then um, especially when I was younger because one I'm Canadian so there's so many things that Americans get that we don't ever get, or we get like many months or sometimes years later. Um, for instance, when the Dorito tacos came out at Taco Bell, it took about a year and a bit for it to come out in Canada. So essentially every trip to an independent show I'm going to, <laughs> I'm eating these things that are like forbidden in my home country. So it's like, uh, there's the temptation of just stuff that tastes really good and that I like. But then there's also the temptation of you can't have this when you're at home. So like what you're saying about the ice cream, oh, we have new flavors. It's the worst when it's like, um, I don't know. Now there's uh, right now at Tim Hortons, I've had to turn this down essentially every day. There's a mini egg donut and it's only here for April or like Easter. So the end of March. I really want the donut, man, because I know it's gonna be. I know it's gonna be gone. I, I was. So it's it's tough. I was about to say, you know, it goes the other way too. I'm obviously a big Tim Hortons fan. You got ketchup chips. You have all dressing chips. There are things in Canada that I can't have that I wish that I could have. So but, right, it goes that way yeah, too. So you understand? Yeah, I totally. Yeah, you understand that. <laughs> yeah, um, AEW All Elite Wrestling. That uh, is a show that appears every Wednesday night on TNT. Uh, how was that? Because now this you have you have reached the pinnacle, so to speak, of one of the big wrestling promotions, right? You, you started, you know, at a wrestling school. Dad didn't want you to do it. You worked your way up through the independence. You got through uh, Ring of Honor, right, which is a smaller but kind of big wrestling promotion. Then you worked your way to a wrestling promotion called Impact. Again, a bigger-ish promotion. And now here you are, AEW. What was that like? Oh, man. I, I'm i still on this incredible high of not even being able to understand or comprehend the fact that I have 
actually and finally achieved my dream and goal in professional wrestling and like and kind of like people just reiterating it to me in their own way on a daily basis like i can't believe you did this i can't believe this actually happened i can't believe you made it come true and it's like i I actually can't believe it and i was working so hard to make it happen especially during a pandemic too like i'm just I'm at a loss for words. And then to go there and see how amazing the company is and how amazing they treat the talent. And then not only that, but to see the reach and potential of growth on all things like with popularity and social media and visibility on television or the, how my, how many views their YouTube uh, episodes get. It's like been blowing my mind and I'm still like, well, I can't even believe I work here. Uh, yeah. It's, it's an unreal feeling. Does working for another company that rivals uh, the biggest promotion, WWE, or one of the biggest promotion, WWE, do you have this reminiscence of like a Monday Night War? Or are you just like, no, that's not us. We're going to do our thing. They're going to do their thing. I love the thought of competition. And I think AEW is as close to the Attitude Era um, that we're ever going to get again. It's like an underground movement. It's a bunch of hungry guys um, that aren't as well known that are doing their best to bring their characters to life on television every single week. And it's only growing every single week. And uh, I'm excited to see where the company is in the next couple of years. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of it and a part of the growth. And yeah, I, I welcome the competition. I The logo and the name of the company uh, to me is... It doesn't have the same appeal that it did to me when I was uh, a little kid. Yeah. Uh, And I get to work with so many of the people that were a part of that company when I was a fan. And now they're the ones coaching me and kind of giving me advice and guiding me along in AEW. And they have such a range of people with unlimited knowledge and experience. And then people that just laced their boots up four months ago. So uh, I think the potential is there. I think the audience is there and it's only going to grow. And I'm super excited to see what happens. And now that you have started to collect as an older adult, what are some of the things now outside of wrestling that you are a huge fan of? All right. This is not paid. Okay. This is not sideshow slipping me a 20 under the table. This is the truth. Sideshow collectibles, one-sixth scale X-Men figures are awesome. Like, I love them. The Cyclops that came out with the brown jacket is incredible. The Wolverine is incredible. The Magneto is incredible. I've got the Gambit on pre-order ready to go. I'm going to definitely grab the Astonishing X-Men Cyclops. Uh, I love one-sixth scale, especially Hot Toys as well. Um, But yeah, the Sideshow collectible ones are... Awesome. I will also agree with you. It, 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 they are great. They are amazing, but they are a slippery slope. They are. Yeah, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is true. I uh, I was gifted when I when I first visited, uh, they gifted me a Thanos and then it just was downhill from there. I have I mean, you can't see it. it I have a little cabinet as well, but it's just, it. It is now Avengers. It's Captain Marvel. It, I have a Spidey sitting here that I haven't put up. Uh, there's some Star Wars in there. Uh, you obviously see Grogu, i.e. Uh, little young, the child behind me. So, yes, it is a slippery slope. I get it. Um, but just six oh, yeah. scales, or do you like the premium format figures? Uh, you did talk about a um, a Venom statue. Um, was that a Sideshow Collectibles as well? I, I don't know where she ordered it from. This was... Uh probably six or seven years ago. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure. I do like the premium format. It's uh that if I feel like if I started that, we might be having to like remortgage or something. We'll see. But <laughs> <laughs> um, right now one sixth is like my, you know, feeling good about myself. You know, Oh, I'm so I sold a bunch of t-shirts. Yeah, let's grab let's grab a hot toys. Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying you're an X Men guy. That's your go to. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like literally, if Sideshow drops anything X Men, I'm pre ordering it on the spot. What would you say is your next fandom outside of X Men? Um. Well, for me, I would say my tops are Spider Man and Batman, and then underneath that is uh, like X Men would fall, especially the animated series stuff. But uh, 
anything to do with like Spider-Man or Batman is usually I'm good. That's, I'm good to go. <laughs> Ethan, we're like the same dude, right? We love res- professional yeah. wrestling. <laughs> Spider-Man, huge Spider-Man guy. Love uh, Batman, yeah. uh, you know, and now uh, X-Men. So yeah, we're 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 in the same tribe, my friend. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's good content. They they make good stuff. They tell good stories, and they're good characters. You, you know what I say? It is. It's always it's the villains. I'm I'm, I'm a huge villain guy. I'm a huge villain. Whether it's it's uh, Marvel, DC professional wrestling the bigger the heel i get it really just makes me like love the character even more right the good guys are okay but sometimes they're just so cut and dry that they are pretty much boring to me hence why i'm not the biggest hogan fan i'll fully admit it uh but macho man however he was both heel and uh a baby face or a good guy and to me like he was just the best so uh anybody that is a huge fan of the villains is is okay my oh dude that's like essentially the reason that i love spider-man and batman like the rogues gallery for each is like so deep and so colorful and even their d-list villains are like a-list to me because of the way they're presented in the cartoons or in the comic books and stuff like that and i would say mr freeze if you're like any superhero super villain my number one is mr freeze uh if it's anybody i just love his story and it's like arguable that he's not even a bad guy he's just doing it for his yeah. wife he's just trying to bring her back to life man yeah so it's like those deep stories that's super compelling well uh again that makes me happy that you like uh <laughs> all of those those genres and all of those franchises just about as much as i do yeah well before we go uh i always ask this question for every guest and i'll ask you the same uh if you were to book your own pop culture main event at all out what would it be and why it could literally be anything it could be he-man versus grogu in a steel cage match or it could be thanos versus thing uh in a no holds barred uh barbed wire match whatever you want it to be it could be any person it could be any pop culture icon what would your main event of pop culture all out be and why it would be a fight to the death literally someone has to die batman versus joker i just want to see if batman can do it I feel like that is going to be a very long match, and I, I will be honest. I don't, <laughs> I don't think the Joker's killing Batman because he needs him, and I don't think Batman's killing Joker because he needs him. But I, it's like you the, ha- it's the question I need an answer. Uh, yeah, I have to know. I have to know. If I get the chance to do it, I have to. Know. Well, you're the Booker, Ethan. Who wins? Who goes over? You have to decide. You just cut. You just oh, put yourself man. in a okay. corner, buddy. I would have the Joker kill Batman. Oh. Because I feel they've they've had other people play Batman, so um, yeah. So yeah, so Robin, aka Nightwing, will take over the mantle, or his one of his many sons, or yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, all right. And then you get a rematch next year at All Out. Yeah, there you go. Or yeah. out of nowhere, he wasn't dead all along. We've seen it done a thousand times, folks, in comic books. Oh, we know yeah. it's he's coming I mean, back one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> well, hey man, this was a lot of fun. This was great. Uh, Ethan Page all ego where could the sideshow faithful find you on social media if they are so inclined to do so on twitter i'm at official ego on instagram i'm at official underscore ego i know it's annoying i'm very sorry uh but if you guys want to support you can grab my brand new ethan page t-shirt at shop and uh yeah i have a weekly vlog on youtube as well every single wednesday and that's youtube.com slash ethan page vlog Look at that. You can find you all over social media. I'm a fan. All over. I'll be watching. Dude, thank you so much for joining us. Don't worry. We are going to uh, do an all Ethan, or excuse me, an all ego Ethan Page workout here in just a moment. I wrote it especially for you. So hopefully you, uh, <laughs> being a functional fitness or CrossFit fan, maybe you'll do it one of these days and you'll send me the video and show me that you enjoyed yourself. But for the, yeah. for you folks at home, you may or may not enjoy it. And I take no shame in putting you through a terrible but fun workout. So stick around. We'll be back in just a moment. Sideshow Collectibles, what's up? It's Josh G and Jen Houston, and we have another workout for you today. It is three movements, all body weight. We got push-ups, squat taps, and of course, mountain climbers. A fun rep scheme of 10, 15, 20, 15, 10. You're probably like, what are you talking about, Josh? Don't worry, Jen will demonstrate, and I will commentate in three, two, one, let's go. 
So the first movement in this workout is the good old fashioned push-up. Jen's gonna get to the top of her push-up. She's gonna lower herself down to the ground. Her chest is gonna touch the ground and she's gonna show me full extension at the top. That would be considered a good push-up. Now, if that is too difficult for you, you can drop to your knees and you can do what's called a knee push-up. That's right, same thing, lowering yourself down to the ground and pressing yourself up at the top. Now the next movement in this workout is called a squat tap. You're basically squatting all the way down or as low as you can. You're tapping the floor and then you're jumping up and clapping at the top. Look at Jen go. Now, it doesn't matter if you go left or right. As long as you squat below parallel and jump all the way up, that is considered a good solid rep. And the last movement in this workout, and certainly not the least, is the mountain climber. So Jen is gonna get to the top of her push-up. She's gonna get her knees as high as she can go. That would be one, that would be two. Your goal is gonna be 10, 15, 20, 15, 10. Of course, we're gonna discuss the rep scheme here in a moment, but that, my friends, is considered a good mountain climb. So again, just to reiterate, you're gonna do 10 push-ups, 10 squat taps, 10 mountain climbers, then you're gonna do 15, 15, 15, then 20, 20, 20, then 15, 15, 15, then 10, 10, 10. All body weight, like we've said before, you could do this in your kitchen, in your garage, in your living room, at a gym, not at a gym, wherever you'd like. Jen, did you have a good time? So fun, out of breath. So much fun, she's out of breath. I always have a good time with you guys. Thank you for another fun episode of Get Super with Josh and G. And like I always say, don't forget to let your geek side show. Be sure to subscribe by hitting the S icon on your screen and click the bell icon to be notified whenever a new video is posted. Thanks for watching and don't forget to let your geek side show.